the junior silver exploration companies, which were horrendously overpriced 18 months ago, are coming down into ranges where if I could finance them and get a warrant to participate in the upside, I'd deploy capital. Okay. Uh, right now, the two companies that I've been talking to have decided that my capital isn't cheap enough for them while <laughs> they are cheap enough for me. Yeah. So in the silver space, I am going back to try to true names. Special coverage of the New Orleans Investment Conference is brought to you by Victoria Gold, leading Yukon's new gold rush. Welcome back to the special coverage of the New Orleans Investment Conference. I'm Kai Hoffman, the JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the SOAR Financial Group, and I'm joined by Rick Rule. Rick, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us here on, on our little booth here. It's good Hi. to see you. Kai, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, you're one of the keynotes here, obviously, and lot, lots going on. But before we talk about your talk and what, what you want to leave the investors with, let's talk uranium for a minute, because there was a lot of news in the sector uh, just this week. Uh, Cameco spent a lot of money. They bought an uh, energy services provider, you said Westinghouse, um, $7.4 billion transaction in total. And uh, Uranium Energy bought a uh, Rough Rider deposit from Rio Tinto. So if you just take that money, that's uh, $800 million combined. Or if you take the full Monty of the Westinghouse transaction, that's closer to $7.5 billion sort of transacted in the Uranium space. My point is, Cameco is always the number one buyer of next gen, at least in some people's minds. How does that affect the sector and like how, how the flow of funds being diverted now to buying energy services instead of projects affect the sector? Cameco is still the best potential buyer for next gen in the sense that they have the political cover to buy the best undeveloped deposit in Canada. But they're not the only potential buyer. Uh, any of the large integrated mining companies would love to own it. BHP would love to own it. Rio would love to own it. Of course, the Chinese and the Indians would love to own it. And I don't think the fact that uh, Cameco and Brookfield bought Westinghouse takes Cameco out of the running in the yeah. sense that particularly in conjunction with Brookfield, uh, infrastructure financiers, they have access to lots of money. What will determine the next-gen transaction is when the buyer can contract enough pounds from next-gen in the term market at above $60 a pound to finance the construction of the deposit. Then the who, the buyer, becomes less relevant. Makes sense. No, was, so a lot of the money was earmarked, obviously, or earmarked, like in pub, people's minds. In people's does, minds. Does it sort of disrupt the order in the junior mining or in the junior uranium space at all? I don't think so at all. I mean, I don't think so at all. There is plenty of money that is ready to come into the uranium space when, as, and if the term market replaces the spot market and the terms are above $60. $60. And, and I hear some of the contracts that are being signed right now are way above spot. And spot is around $49, I think, $48, $49. Yep. So yep. do you have I mean, any the, idea the, where the market, they're being signed the at? It's like, has that like sort of seeped through? Uh, the uranium business is amazingly opaque. Yeah. I've been trying to understand it for 30 <laughs> years, and I would suggest I'm in third grade. So <laughs> I'd prefer not to answer that question. What I know is that both Kazatomprom and Cameco have said that they will return their mothballed production to production when they can secure term contracts that are high enough that they generate a reasonable return on capital employed. So when you see uh, Kazatomprom return in kind of production, or when you see MacArthur come back into production for Cameco, you will know that the term market is comfortably above 60, and it's comfortably ab above 60 in enough volume to amortize those huge capital expenditures. Until then, we're all guessing. All guessing. No, it's, that's why it's like uranium is not a sector for me because I actually don't know where all the supply is coming from, especially what Sprott is buying as well. Like, right. where is all that uranium coming from? Well, I, I, I don't get I, it. As you said, it's I very opaque. I suspect since you mentioned Sprott, we've bought about 40 million pounds in the last 18 months. And I suspect that the surplus inventories on the spot market are now gone. Yeah. The, in, in truth, if you look at the volumes on the spot market, and you look at the volumes in the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, the real spot market has become the Sprott market. <laughs> it's more liquid yeah. and it's larger volume. <laughs> and, There's no, and they're not selling either. I, I think increasingly <laughs> the tail there wags the dog, and we're wagging the dog pretty hard. Yeah. Um, maybe last comment on the uranium stuff. Uranium Energy bought the Rough Rider deposit. Yep. Any implications, what does it mean? Like what's the Great, tra what's great the transaction. Uh, what it means is that Rio Tinto probably is less interested in consolidating in the uranium space in Canada than they were. Yeah. But it's a wonderful transaction for UEC. UEC is a premium priced company. 
the investors expect a lot out of it. The consequence of that is that they have lower cost of capital, yeah. and they're using that cost of capital to acquire increasingly attractive assets. They're so on a buying spree, yeah. Wonderful deal for everybody. Fantastic. All right, let's, let's start, sort of put a bow around it, done. Great. Uh, let's talk about the conference here. Obviously, okay. gold is at the forefront, US dollar, Fed policies, all of the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about your, conversa uh, your presentation as well. And um, or actually, let's go talk mining stocks first Fine. before we talk about that. Because we had you, I had you on an SF Live, and right. uh, we talked about, or you mentioned, that things are not cheap enough, and we've been going down ever since. Yep. Right. So the question is, we've seen a one cent right, rights offering just yesterday. When is cheap cheap enough? Like, well, I think that's... it depends on what you're buying. Uh, I believe that if you look at the length and breadth of the junior mining space, those 2,500 or so companies worldwide that purport to be in the mineral exploration and development space, uh, that probably only 15% of the issuers have any value at all, no. whatsoever. Uh, I fully agree, actually. <laughs> so if you do a one cent rights offering in a company that's worth nothing, that still means it has farther to fall. I'm not suggesting that company was worth nothing. What has been useful for me is that the whole market has been declining. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's no necessarily re necessary requirement yeah. that I invest in the bad or the ugly, only the good. So from my own personal standpoint, I am trying to be very active in the junior market in the private placement side. The issuers have played chicken with capital markets, <laughs> thinking that capital will get cheaper. They've lost that bet. Now they need to raise capital, and they need to raise capital on terms that are as attractive to investors, I think, as they were five years ago, which is all I need. Well, you like warrants, obviously. I so do. Five full, full, full five-year warrants. I I've seen a, a lot of those lately. I did a deal uh, uh, about two weeks ago on a company that's here uh, exhibiting, Empress Royalty. Mm -hmm. I believe that Empress was selling at a 50% discount to what I could sell their assets for in the private market. <laughs> So I wrote them a deal that was an above market deal. But yeah. In other words, I did the private placement above market because it was so illiquid, I couldn't yeah. have got a position. Uh, and they gave me a full five-year warrant, yeah. which means I participate in the upside growth of the company. I gave them a fair equity deal in that I paid a premium to market, but a yeah. discount to net asset <laughs> value. Um, and these are people that I've come to know and respect. I believe that I can help them grow. This is the type of market where professional investors can get sort of once a decade scores. Yeah, sounds like it, absolutely. And I think it's only getting cheaper because we got tax loss selling looming as well. Like what's your, what's your opinion on tax loss selling? I haven't made up my mind yet. It'll be a little less brutal this year because people don't have gains in other sectors to offset. Yeah. Uh, There's no Bitcoin crypto craze this year or pot, weed stocks to sort of offset that, I think. People in the U.S. aren't taking capital gains on real estate because uh, those prices went to real estate heaven. Yeah. So the idea that you're offsetting gains in other places with losses and resources, given the, the state of the broad market, I think is less critical. What I think people need to be concerned about, and you're seeing this in the yield curve and also in the copper price, is there's increasing fears, and I share them, that we may be on the cusp of a recession. Uh, I believe, as I told you before, Kai, that we face a supply cliff in resources five years from now that'll be ugly, but you won't get a price response necessarily if demand hits a cliff too. Yeah. And I think what's really killing the resource equity markets is the chance that all equity prices are headed low and that we might be headed into a recession. I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to tell you we are or we aren't. I don't know. I'm a creditor. Well, the definition changes on a weekly basis I hear as well, mm -hmm. so. Uh, my that... definition never changes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, but we're here at the New Orleans Investment Conference. Obviously, a lot of great speakers, a lot of great minds here. What are some of the themes you've picked up or a buzzword that keeps coming back to you that, that you hear everywhere? I really haven't had the opportunity to, to hear that, to be honest with you. I like the conference, not just because of the uniformly high caliber of the speakers. I also like it because there's a, a cadre of probably 150 attendees that have been coming to the conference for 20 years themselves. Yeah. And they have a lot of wisdom themselves. The idea that in a, a confab of rich people like this, that all of, the, not, all of the knowledge flows from the dais to the audience is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and so I've enjoyed the conversations I've had with individual investors in terms of their expectation around the market, what they thought was cheap and why. That's been very useful to me. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, no, like I've seen a few people I've seen here six years ago. Yep. Right? So absolutely, I fully subscribe to that. Um, let's talk about your presentations, Natural Resource Strategies for 2023. So yep. it sounds like you sort of, you're done with 22 already. No, 
but I, no, I, I, I gave that talk last year. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, what, I'm, what I think I'm trying to do is ask investors to invest in themselves a little bit, uh, understand their risk tolerance, understand their educational levels, understand their time frames, and in particular to understand the difference between probabilities, which is to say capturing market beta, and possibilities, which is to say chasing alpha. Uh, there are investors for whom uncertain time frames, volatility, and risk are attractive. There's this one guy named Rick Rule who likes all those things. No. For many investors, they don't have the psychological stability or frankly the financial stability to take the risks. And they need to identify that in themselves now. There's going to be a lot of money made in the next 10 year in the natural resource business. And for many investors, constructing a portfolio that is Franco Nevada, Exxon, BHP, uh, Rio Tinto, I mean, my expectation is over 10 years that those portfolios will generate 300% return, just on the beta side, <laughs> paying dividends while you wait. Uh, for most investors, that's probabilistic. It's more no. likely than not to happen. And people who aren't willing to do the work or take the risk or suffer the volatility between now and then uh, probably should confine themselves to the very best of the best names. They're going to make good money. Almost for sure. But already, like Barrick, Newmont, I think we talked about that last time, they're already seeing a 5% dividend yep. yields yep. for a minor. Yep. I don't think I've seen that before. Yep. So well, I, I, you know, there I have, been, there, there have been times in the past. What is unusual isn't just the yield, but rather the relationship between the net present value of future cash flows yep. and enterprise value, which is to say if the gold price holds at this level or goes up to the level of the forward strip, these companies are historically cheap relative to the price of gold, which is attractive. Absolutely, well that's where you make your money. That's right? about probability, right. At the same time, one of the things you're starting to see now is that the capital that was raised by the exploration industry 10 years ago is beginning to bear some fruit. There's some discoveries taking yeah. place worldwide. I haven't seen a discovery cycle in this business since the early 1990s, and I'm beginning to see some attractive discoveries come up. Are these things certain? Yeah. No. Are they low risk? No. But there's light at the end of the exploration tunnel that is not an oncoming freight train, no. and that's attractive. Well, we talked about that earlier, because we, we raised $6.7 billion in the junior sector last year, mm -hmm. and I asked you, it was like... Wasted most of it. Yes, exactly, that was sort of what you answered back then yep. as well. Yep. But, because uh, it felt like we hadn't much to show for at the time. Right. It's changed a little bit. We've it seen has. Snowline come out. Um, they're here at the conference as well. That's why I just talked to Scott, yep. um, for example, come out with interesting results. Is it a discovery yet? We don't, we don't know yet, but it looks really intriguing. Very exciting. Uh, exciting too because it was grassroots. Exactly. It was conceptual, generative grassroots. The industry hasn't done enough of that for 30 years. Exactly. I mean, where you're really seeing the discoveries are places that people are afraid to go. You're seeing them yeah. in Uganda. You're seeing them in Malawi. Uh, you're seeing them in Mali, Niger, yeah. Burkina Faso. I was in Kazakhstan two weeks ago. Yeah. so. Great jurisdiction, by the way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I was, I was really impressed. That's why I keep bringing it up in conversation because yep. yep. I was actually blown away. Yep. So, um, one of the panelists, I think panelists, or one of the guests I talked to, you mentioned you jumped hand over fist in silver right now, or you're jumping in right now into silver. Is that that's wrong? A true statement? No. no okay. <laughs> what I where are you deploying your capital what, was actually what, the question. What I, what I have been saying is that the junior silver exploration companies, which were horrendously overpriced 18 months ago are coming down into ranges where if I could finance them and get a warrant to participate in the upside, I'd deploy capital. Okay. Uh, right now, the two companies that I've been talking to have decided that my capital isn't cheap enough for them, while <laughs> they are cheap enough for me. Yeah. So in the silver space, uh, I am going back to try to true names. Pan American, mm -hmm. which is in the penalty box. <laughs> uh, well, Escobar is still looming over them, I think. Escobar and Navidad. They yeah. have a billion ounces of high-grade silver they can't mine but they it. get no credit for yeah. it at all. And my suspicion is in the next five years, one or the other of those deposits gets permitted, which doubles Pan American's production. And I get that for free. <laughs> uh, free is a price I'm really attached, attracted to. I like MAG. Uh, yeah. I didn't like MAG a year and a half ago because it was selling at twice net present value. It's selling yeah. at net present value now, and you get all yeah. the upside for nothing. Yeah. I like Silvercrest. Yeah. The market doesn't know if they're going to be able to turn on the mine at nameplate capacity or not. <laughs> uh, I'm willing to take the bet at today's price that they are. Because the deposit's big enough and rich enough that if they have six months worth of fumble, it'll hurt the share price, but it won't hurt the net present value. No. 
Well, so I'm attracted like, to that. Yeah, no, fantastic. Rick, some closing remarks, something you want the investors to walk away from this conference? Like one of the, you, you mentioned, you, you sort of, I can just copy and paste something you said earlier, I think it makes sense. Just do your due diligence, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, listen, and people I, are here to learn, right? What amuses me is that uh, most investors are more attracted to stories, narrative, than they are to arithmetic. Yeah. <laughs> people say, why would I invest in gold stocks? Because the gold stocks price is falling. That's why. The assets are getting cheaper. If you decide that you think that gold will retain, as an example, its traditional merit <laughs> in financial circumstances, the fact that the price is going down and the price of gold equity is going down is a good thing, not a bad thing. No. The fact that people don't recognize that is a huge advantage to me, but it's less beneficial for them. Well, it doesn't fit the narrative, right? right? As you said, fantastic, Rick. Great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks for making the time. I'm sure you've Pleasure. got a busy schedule. Thanks for the And uh, thanks for coming on. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. SF Live special coverage from the New Orleans Investment Conference. We were joined by the fantastic Rick Rule, semi-retired, supposed to be retired. <laughs> and uh, make sure to follow us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, hit that like and subscribe button, and uh, we'll be back with lots more.